section one, scenes of madness. One, Tony Perkins wrote that out for me. He actually wrote out two. He wrote out the number two Corinthians. I took exactly what Tony said, and I said, well, Tony has to know better than anybody. Two, I don't want to get into it. It's very personal. You know, when I talk about the Bible, it's very personal. So I don't want to get into verses. I don't want to get into it. The Bible means a lot to me, but I don't want to get into specifics. Three, Proverbs, the chapter, never bend to envy. I've had that thing all, my, all of my life where people are bending to envy. Four, well, I think many, I mean, when we get into the Bible, I think many, so many. And some people look an eye for an eye. You can almost say that. Uh, that's not a particularly nice thing, but you know, if you look at what's happening to our country, I mean, when you see what's going on with our country, how people are taking advantage of us, we have to be firm and have to be very strong. And we can learn a lot from the Bible that I can tell you. <laughs> and notes, this is um, partially polemical. <laughs> Section two, introduction. Um, it is utterly predictable that an American who does work partially in biblical studies would point to the inverse relation between a boobish president and biblical texts. After all, one is more likely to defend what they spend their time working on, preferring to note an inverse relation between acceptable use and political evils. Of course, then it is a tantalizing prospect attempting to gesture to a certain type of biblical irrelevancy that the Trump presidency points toward. Um, but by a certain type of biblical irre irrelevancy, I do not mean to suggest that the Bible has disappeared in the political sphere, nor something equally silly, like that theology or religion are no longer politically relevant. We saw too often theological apologies for the actions and words of Trump by people with popular religious authority, um, popular uh, uh, preachers and people like that. Uh, for instance, in my own home state of Texas, uh, Robert Jeffries, a first Baptist preacher. Um, Trump as well consistently appeals to the religious persuasions and affections of his audience. He saturates his audience with concerns for the evangelicals, for the favorings of Christianity, for the freedom of pastors and church people to be able to do and say things that many of them believe have been eroded during the near decade of Obama's term. Um, there is clear religious tension that Trump plays into. Uh, a third section shifts. I mean to su suggest that the Bible's relevance can be read as having shifted, though even noting this does not enter into bold claims about the intransigence of this shift. Um, a shift implies context, and the context of this shift is narrow in scope. Um, in point of fact, it is quite obvious that the Bible has not left political discourse. In this sense, one can note a, a subsection of shift, one which precedes the contextual shift to be kind of sort of fleshed out later. Um, the Bible, in one sense, was more often than not at the forefront of political discourse, but it appeared in otherwise strange places, places that would not have been obvious or interesting in the last few elections uh, in the US. Um, regularly, images of Jesus are used in political left discourse, uh, particularly in memes that attempt to either make a serious point about how a particular understanding of, for instance, Jesus' ethic would work out if transposed into the 24th century. Um, you know, nothing too novel, as this is par for the course in public discu uh, discussions of ethics in the West. Or in memes that parody a conservative Jesus who, for instance, withholds health care because a lame man's inability to work, um, or who asks for money before feeding the 5,000. This shift, perhaps an example of the radical Bible that James points to in British politics, is only a relative shift, um, seen as an intensification because of conservative atrophy and the ease of media dissemination in the world of social media. Um, of course, the radical Bible tradition hasn't been utilized effectively in any major US elections that I'm aware of, um, except maybe recently. Uh, much less presidential elections, despite some gestures by people like Bernie Sanders to the ethos of Jesus. Um, he spoke to Liberty University, for instance. And yet it cannot be ignored that presidents uh, in the US from Obama to Bush to Clinton and beyond have used biblical materials in support of principles, especially broadly American principles. 
Bush frequently employs biblical materials, not to mention theological ideas, to supplement his speeches. He frequently mixes in biblical motifs and imagery, talking of a light on a hill, um, or utilizing the familiar Samaritan parable. Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton, as well, was quite open about his relationship to the Bible and his own faith, even employing, if sometimes in a bit of a convoluted way, verses from the Psalms or Proverbs. And Obama as well often quoted from the Bible, um, whether from you know, Matthew or you know, famously from 2 Timothy during, I believe, uh, maybe the, the National Day of Prayer, I, I believe it was, or maybe it was the National Breakfast Prayer, whatever it's called. Too many prayer breakfast national things going on in the U.S. Um, however, Trump's relationship to the Bible mirrors his own, or his use of other props uh, for public image. Quotations and allusions are few and far between and often egregious. Uh, his use is often a misuse, much like his use of relational props, family, per, familial parading, um, boasting of properties and wealth, uh, bravado and machismo. We can recall then his early recollection of a favorite Bible verse, one which didn't exist. Um, there is no, despite his confidence, verse about not bending to envy in Proverbs, and it should be particularly egregious that this is said to an evangelical interviewer, someone who should kind of pick up on that. Um, but these incidents are not isolating, isolated. They occur over and over again in the course of a year and a half uh, long presidential election, something that's much too long. Um, section four, uh, evangelicals. It must be remember, remembered that uh, Elizabeth uh, Diaz wrote an article that appeared in Time Magazine on September 26, 2016, called, quote, the pastor who prays with Trump, end quote. It is hard to not categorize this as a puff piece, um, despite the fact that I can't really point to any determinate political agenda behind Diaz's, uh, behind her persona that justifies a pro-Trump slant. Um, this comes at a time that is near the end of a long year and a half battle, one with numerous gaffes, but also a lengthy war that seems to justify over and over to observers that Trump doesn't have much of a relation with biblical materials, much less with Christianity in an obvious hands-on sense, which would be a necessity, one would think, for an evangelical voter. Here in this piece, Diaz points to a near decade and a half friendship, or at least an acquaintanceship, between a well-known televangelist, Paula White, and Trump. The two have allegedly had a long and fruitful relationship, one which included Trump attending numerous Bible studies with White. Um, Diaz admits, of course, that Trump's spirituality has been a, quote, mystery during the campaign. Um, and again, this is coming right before, you know, the election um, happens. Um, this is a mystery despite his public announcements of his Christian religiosity. Uh, but we have to note the ambiguity in this whole mess. Um, Diaz in this piece points to the 15 year history of Trump's relationship with a Pentecostal leaning, non-denominational televangelist, his prayer sessions with her, his attendance of Bible studies, and other things of this sort. These seem to fly in the face of his numerous public biblical gaffes, and also it's strange that these things would be pointed out while also noting the mystery behind Trump. Um, but about these gaps, we recall his not knowing the usual name, way of naming some biblical texts. And at the quote at the beginning, you know, of course he defers blame onto someone else. Um, um, his fabrication of texts, his refusal to name his favorite texts, uh, and an almost absolute, absolute lack of biblical references, much less relevant or carefully picked ones. Um, though they do occur some after the campaign. Um, they can be heard when he stays on track, sticking to prompts um, in some recent speeches, but they do not come natural as they seem to with Bush, Clinton, or Obama. Despite all of this, Trump is baptized. Here there is a, a subtle shift, a shift from the Bible being a political tool that occurs naturally to the politician, one that the politician wields as a weapon of persuasion, to a political tool utilized by the supporters of the politician. Um, Christianity imposes its imperial substance, baptizing the hapless fool while also fooling itself, thinking it has truly converted the savage. We recall the often used evangelical defense of Trump, 
Um, he is only a baby Christian. He is just learning how to be like Jesus and how to love the scriptures. But we have always read what we want to into our politicians. After all, Obama was the paragon of leftist virtues, despite being a raging neoliberal who continued usual American foreign policy. Section five, what shift does it matter? To continue on with this comparative game, uh, to try to gesture to a shift that I can't quite name or put my finger on, I think requires noting that the Trump, that with Trump, it is precisely because he doesn't proof text the Bible that he doesn't have a Bible in the same way that someone like Thatcher or Corbyn or Obama or Bush, to, to name a few, did. We find a peculiar political uh, authority in glances towards texts, even when they don't show up in the places we would expect to politicize texts to. Bush's biblical authority come from his public religious life, his autobiography, his continual use of biblical figures like Moses or books like Acts um, to underwrite his story, no matter how self-affirming and gratuitous the use of these texts may be. Trump, however, uses the Bible as a political piece, but is largely evacuated of similar uses. The Bible is a sort of hollow prop um, to be held and thrust in the air, as he often did. Um, he eschews a stronger oral dimension um, that one sees or one hears in other leaders who have utilized the Bible. The words, the phrases, the stories that remind, catalyze emotion and call forth an imaginative aspect for the especially evangelical listener are absent. But at this late stage, I have to admit the ambiguity and in fact the contradiction between my early inclination um, put quite strongly about shifts in the Trump era it isn't proper to speak of a shift in the Trump era because this era has been in flux since June 2015 when he began his race, straight out of the gate with an eye affixed on the evangelical contingent, a subset that he overwhelmingly won. Despite the overall lack of comparatively biblical references, allusions, and motifs in his campaign, he has deferred to the safer route, finding time to quote verbatim some passages during very specific post-campaign moments, um, most notably, um, his inauguration and the National Prayer Breakfast um, back in February, where he quoted, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Um, it is only now that, we, that he begins to make tendentious connection between perhaps starting a formation of a Trump Bible, where values are connected to texts, such as in the National Prayer Breakfast, where this quote that he references uh, is, you're gesturing to a soldier who was martyred for the cause of American freedom, as he might put it. Well, he wouldn't put it that way, but. I'm not sure then uh, what we can actually say about Trump's Bible, but it seems clear that if it materializes, if it ceases being a specter, it does so in a very public way, and it does so over time. It isn't thrust upon the scene in a mature state, like some of his people that came before him, but instead is, like Trump himself, quite clear in its own strange imperfections that seem to call to the initiated like a moth to the flame. That's it.